ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله ونبيه وخليله ادى الامانه ونصح الامه وجاهد في الله حق جهاده حتى اتاه اليقين من ربه in the name of allah the most merciful the most compassionate peace and blessings be upon our prophet muhammad alayhi salatu wassalam his companions his followers and all those who followed him until the day of judgment my brothers and sisters first of all um, my thanks and reward for the brothers uh, and sisters who invited me to be here amongst you today um, it's an amazing blessing that as a muslim you travel around the world and you always find your home in the masjid which when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam as first act in while arriving in medina was to give that home to the muslim to the believer that was his first act in order for those who didn't have a home, who left Mecca, to have directly a home in Medina without building one of their own. And from that moment, every, every existing Muslim from that moment, never think of that that way. That you have homes in almost every city, in almost every village around the world. So wherever you go, you find a home, and that's, that's where we are, we are today. Um, our subject today is Ramadan. Ramadan is approaching us and the faster it's approaching the more the question arises: are we ready for it are we ready for Ramadan because we not we can't postpone it we can't delay it we can't ask for a delay like you know I don't really feel like it this year you know it's the summertime and I'm not really doesn't really fit in my schedule that's the funny thing about Ramadan you can't it's coming, it's happening, they just have to deal with it. Only dealing with something unprepared is knowing that the result will be nothing, right? Won't be that much. And the question I would like to ask you first and ask myself before that is why are you going to fast? Thinking of Ramadan approaching, did you ever think of those Ramadans you spent, do you know, if, I, if somebody would ask you now, how many Ramadans did you fast in your life? Would you know the answer? Would you know? Tell me. Yes or no? Would you know the answer without thinking just like that? I had 30, 25, 30, 13, 15, would you know? No, you have to think, right? When did I begin? When did I start? Was it 14? Was it 15? Was it 25, right? You don't know the answer, right? Do you or you don't? Sort of, right? Why am I asking this question? Because Ramadan comes and goes. And when we stand still about that fact that Ramadan comes and goes, we will stand still about the fact that we are not getting the best out of it. As believers, as those who chose to be a Muslim, who chose to be a believer, who signed for that religion, which means that they said to themselves and to their creator that, yes, Ya Allah, you created me in order to worship you, right? And one of the forms of worship is Ramadan. So I'll get back to the question, why do you fast? Can you give me an answer? To you. I like it when people interact. So why, why do you fast? Because? It's an obligation. Fair enough. It's an obligation. So you fast because it's an obligation. So if it was not an obligation, you wouldn't fast, right? Okay. That's, that's fair enough. Why do you fast? Who else? Why do you fast? Because? To control? To train yourself for not falling in sin. That could be. So it's a sort of training for yourself, right? What else? Sorry? Clean cleansing. Clean yourself. Okay, fair enough. What else? To achieve taqwa. What is taqwa? A difficult Arabic word. In one word, in one word. Is taqwa sincerity? Is that taqwa God's fear, right? God's love, it could be as well. 
Usually, the average Muslim today, wherever you go, if you would ask, why do you fast? You'll get these answers as well. One of the answers you hear most, especially when um, those who are not Muslim, for example, uh, ask the question, why do you fast? And mainly we say, because we want to think about the poor, right? Because we think about the poor, right? Because we think about those who do not fast. Because we want to train, as you said, train ourselves, have a diet, eat less, etc., etc. But if I would only want to enlighten that where we say that we think about the poor, some of us say, right? I mean, one of the virtues of Ramadan could that you feel with those who don't have food, correct? While you are fasting. But does that, does, does that go through after you finish your fasting? What happens then? Do you still think of the poor? So the rule, I'll ask you about the rule. If we look at our shopping um, addiction during Ramadan concerning food, would you say that because of Ramadan, because we are, we are not eating during the day, that we shop less or we shop more for food? Less or more? More, that's weird. I'm fasting, so it means I have less time to eat, right? I have less need to eat. And you say now, you shop more for food. What do you do with that food? You're not eating it secretly, right? So why? I'll tell you an assessment I did myself in Holland, asking um, people who work, I mean, who have uh, you know, shops who sell uh, meat and, and bakeries and, and halal stuff and everything during Ramadan. I asked them, does your income raise in Ramadan or does it go lower? What they say? They say it raises, right? Okay, then I say your profit during Ramadan, does it multiply or does it get triple or more? You know what the outcome was of the majority of these places? What do you think? Double? Triple? Is that it? Well, fasten your seatbelt. <laughs> Ten times. And this is not a, a, a storytelling, this is reality. You see the queues, right? Do you ever see outside Ramadan queues at the bakery? Do you see queues in the supermarket like you see them in Ramadan? You don't go to Islamic Muslim countries. Malaysia wouldn't be different, other countries. What does that mean? So we buy 10 times more food during Ramadan than we do outside Ramadan. That is weird. If I have less time to eat, if I'm fasting, which means I'm cooking less, I'm cooking less? No, I'm not cooking less. Okay, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> what does that mean then? That means that actually I'm eating more. But in the meanwhile, when you ask me, I say, I think about the poor. How does that work? Can you explain? Okay, another thing. Others would say, because I want Ramadan to um, make me a better person, correct? So I can, you know, train myself, right? In order to be a better human being. What happens? How do our mosques look like during Ramadan? Usually, packed, right? Packed, especially Fajr. Suhoor, you just have eaten, right? You go for, for, to the mosque. How does it look like after Ramadan? And not after Ramadan, one week after, the day after Ramadan. How does our Fajr prayer look like? I did a check myself as well, just to observe. During Ramadan, we had in our local masjid five, six, how do you call them, rows? The following day, we had half of one. That says something, right? What I want to say about this, and I can continue for the whole evening, we have misconceptions ourselves about our religion, our deen, and one of the biggest misconceptions concerns Ramadan as well. Let me tell you something. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran al-Kareem, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا كتب عليكم الصيام كما كتب على الذين من قبلكم لعلكم تتقون That's the word, right? Taqwa. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran al-Kareem, He links that it, it's made an obligation, an obligation for you in order to attain taqwa so the the formula should be one plus one is two which means 
you as a believer, because, it, because you have to fast, the result of that fasting should be God-fearing. You can, you can turn it around. You fast because you fear God. So you don't fast because it's culture. You don't fast because everybody does it. You don't fast because you go for a diet. You fast in order to reach, to obtain, attain taqwa. Okay, let me put it this way. Um, the body of the human being. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Okay. The human being. Out of how many pieces does he contain? Three pieces. Mind, aql, right? Brains. Body, right? Which is the body. And the soul, correct? Ar-ruh, the soul. And nafs, you could call it as well. A car as well. A car contains as well the three elements. The body, the shasi, you know, the outside. The aql, the system. The mind, you know, the, the system which runs the car. And the soul is what? Is what? The? The? No. What is the soul of the car? The engine. No, the engine. The engine is the soul. Without that engine, you can't have a Maserati. But if you have a, an engine of a Peugeot like my brother he has, it's not going to work. You're not going to get everything out of it, right? Okay, so if you have that new car with that engine, with that engine in it. How do you treat a new car with a new engine? How do you treat it? You treat it nicely, right? You treat it nicely. The brother knows here. Slowly, you know, the engine has to get used to it, etc. When you need oil, what kind of oil you put in? You just put any olive oil or something? The best one, right? Especially if you have a nice car, the best oil. What kind of petrol? My car is, for example, diesel. Do I, pet, do I put unleaded fuel in it? Do? No. I don't, right? I put what kind of fuel? The fuel it needs, correct? When do, what do I do? I service the car. I, sir, I have a Maserati, so I have to bring it to the Maserati specialist, right? Every now and then, I have to service it. I don't know in Malaysia, but do you have, do you have something called a yearly, um, a yearly thing which you have to go through a uh, service? You, which you get a stamp? Yeah. And you can't drive without that one? How do, how's it called? No, it's not, I don't know if it's about road tax, but in Holland, you have something called APK. Once a year, in most of the countries, you have to bring your car to, the, uh, to somebody who is independent, right? Who has to check your car, evaluate it, see what's wrong. You have to fix it if something's wrong, and you get a stamp. If you don't get a stamp, you're not allowed to be on the road. You're not allowed to be on the road, right? That's the rule of the country. Is, is that here as well? Yeah, there is. The? Puspakom. That's something you heard. So, which means your car has to go through that test once a year on obligation on a certain date, right? Evaluate your car, see what's wrong with it, how is your engine, how is it, how is that? Um, in order to, if there's something they tell you, go fix this and go fix that, don't come back, and then they give you stamp. Without the stamp, you're not allowed to be on that road. Do you understand which conclusion I want to go to? Which one? What is our APK or how you call it? Puspakom. What is it? What is that for our soul? What is that? Yes? That's Ramadan. Ramadan is an obligation on a certain moment of the year. And actually, the reason behind it is that you clean, your, evaluate yourself first. Evaluate yourself. That's the first 10 days, you know, the 10 days of, of, of mercy. You have to Evaluate for yourself. See what's wrong with you. See what's happening. See how last year was. Because we believe, as the Prophet ﷺ says, between a Ramadan and Ramadan is forgiven, right? Between a fasting and a fasting of Ramadan is forgiven. It's just not like that. So you have to evaluate in that month. You have to check yourself. Go through a check. What is wrong with my soul, with my mind, with my body? You fast. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you, don't eat, don't drink, etc. So you can have, you can prioritize. Make a priority on that evaluation don't think about your body now think only about your soul or your body in the morning and late evening right train yourself behave be a better person why because when you finish god tells you i don't want you to be back on the road until you finish the month right 
You can't in the middle of the Ramadan say, you know, and now I want to stop. You can't. 30 days, 29 days, you have to go through that check. But nobody does that check for you except yourself. Not the garage, not the government, not your father, yourself. You do that. And that's why when you have the intention, we know in Ramadan and Sheikh, Abu, uh, Sheikh, you, Sheikh Tawfiq will talk later on about the fiqh of Ramadan. One of the essentials is you have the intention to fast, right? When do you do that intention? Not every day. You do it once before you go to sleep of the first day of Ramadan. You go to sleep with the intention, I am going to fast the rest of the whole month because it's an obligation for me in order to attain taqwa, right? So you, you go through the test. And my brothers and sisters, let's be honest with each other. Why is it then that, that we give us ourselves not the best oil? Right? We don't give ourselves the best. We don't service ourselves. We don't go to the best garage. And we are, you have to compare yourself as that Maserati. And I give this example, especially maybe for the brothers who would maybe relate to the cars more than the sisters. But you are being given this beautiful car, which is worth at about two, three hundred thousand dollars as an amana. This friend, so it's like Dean giving me this Maserati and telling me, Akhi Muhammad, this Maserati is for you. You can have it, but I want it back. I'm not going to tell you when. You can have it. Drive it, enjoy it, whatever you want to do. But I want it back. I'm not going to tell you when. How am I going to treat this thing? Am I going to blow it up? No. Am I going to put diesel in it? No, I'm going to drive it smoothly, nicely, beautifully. Way because Dean could come any moment. And I, I respect my brother. And I love him. And I want him to get his amana back the way he gave it to me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us our soul as an amana, our body as an amana, ourselves as an amana. And he said, you will have to return to me, but I'm not going to tell you when. So how do you treat yourself? How do you behave? How do you feed yourself? How do you act? How do you treat yourself? How do you treat others? That counts for, the, for your whole life, but specifically and especially in Ramadan. Because it's one of these moments that you don't have any choice than to do it. And if you have to do it, then the Prophet ﷺ says, Be aware that your day of Ramadan doesn't end only with hunger and thirst. Be aware of that. He's warning us. He's telling us, be aware that your fasting, your fasting the day does not end only by hunger and thirst. So it goes back to why I am, am I fasting? And if I can answer that question, why I am fasting properly, I will answer how I am fasting, correct? My brothers, do you know that we spend in Ramadan an average of six, or at least our wives usually, or our mothers maybe, an average of five to six hours in the kitchen? Do you imagine? Five to six hours in the kitchen. If you sleep another eight hours, that's how many hours together? 14 hours. You have 10 hours to go. Suppose you work, you study. What does that leave you? With two hours a day? One and a half hour? How many time do we, sp do we spend eating? That's amazing. You know, the priority should be something else. Which means if I'm having now three meals a day, two warm and one cold meal, depending on your culture, I'm supposed to have Ramadan only two meals a day. I should be less. I should eat less, right? To train myself better. I should behave. I should make priorities. I should understand. I should be a better Muslim. I shouldn't be a Ramadan Muslim. Because that behavior should be the foundation of the rest of the year. But it can't be a foundation if it's not, do it, it, it have, it is not being done well. If that test, that evaluation, that period, that person, that month is not being well behaved or well used, then the result will be nil. You know, my brothers and sisters, why, why do we have Eid? Do we know the reason behind Eid? Nowadays, when you ask some, a, a Muslim why do we have Eid, he would tell you to celebrate the end of Ramadan. Right? Do we celebrate the end of Ramadan? 
The funny part is, it's not the case. That's the interesting part. Because the Sahaba, the companions of the Prophet Wasallam, used to cry for Ramadan not to leave them. Look, subhanAllah. They didn't want Ramadan to go. They started with the first 10 days and warming up. Then they find their, they ease their rest. They found relaxing in fasting. Their body, their soul reacted on a proper way on it. On the last 10 days, they were begging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to save them from, from the hellfire. And then they saw, they felt that Ramadan was changing them. Ramadan was giving them a makeover. You know these programs where they do makeover of houses? That a stinky house, not looking well from, the, from a certain moment, gets a makeover and it becomes a beautiful house? They feel Ramadan is giving them a makeover. So they don't want it to finish. They want to keep this feeling, this beauty, this ease, this relaxing until the rest of the year. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells, the, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa tells them in hadith uh, alayhi salatu wasalam, that know that one of the moments you meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and, and the beauty and, and, and you're happy is when you break fast. And therefore Eid came to let them forget the sadness of leaving Ramadan. So it's not happiness. No, Eid is actually to forget the sadness of leaving Ramadan. Why? Because they were doing it the correct way. And it brings us brothers and sisters about if we say this, what is fasting then? You know, if I, if I compare back home, Holland, for example, yes, we do have in the summer like this one, very long days. We fast about 21 hours. Our Maghrib is about 10.30 in the summer. And our Fajr is about 2 o'clock in the morning, which leaves you with 21 hours of fasting, right? That's a long day, correct? And you'll hear a lot of people complaining, Ya Allah, it's a long day, Ya Allah, you know, it's warm, Ya Allah, it's so heavy this year, Ya Allah, I can't fast. You talk to somebody who doesn't go to work, yeah, I'm fasting, you know, I can't go to work. I talk to Muslim, why aren't you smiling today? You know, I'm fasting, how can I smile? SubhanAllah, that's funny. It should be the opposite. You should be relaxing and, and smiling and be good because this, this month is, is in your favor. Yes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, knows of that difficulty of the long day and of the hot and everything and you have to adapt and manage to that but still if we would understand then the non-muslims would see the muslim changing a ramadan to better not to worse my brothers and sisters do you know that the the, the highest percentage of absence at work is during ramadan in the west the highest person of absence at work is during ramadan what does that say? Because Muslims stay at home during Ramadan. They say, oh, I want to take off, you know, so I can have really a proper way of ibadah, a proper way of ibadah. And we sleep during the whole day. I mean, who are you holding for crazy? And then we come to the definition of fasting because when you answer, you have to answer your, your question of why I'm fasting. So what is fasting? And there comes our biggest mistake and our biggest misconception. We think that fasting is not eating and not drinking right if somebody asks you today what is fasting what is your answer i'm not allowed to eat and to drink right that's my answer correct well shall i tell you breaking news that's not it definition of fasting is not to withhold from 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 food and water oh no fasting is to withhold from everything which breaks the fast Everything. When those three late women in, living in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he called them to his house in order to, to set an example by them. And he told them, you have to throw over. They said, Ya Rasulullah, how can we throw over? We haven't been eating the whole day. It was Ramadan. Then he said, no, I want you to throw over. To symbolize, you know, to symbolize what was... They said, Ya Rasulullah, you know, it has been, you know, we haven't been eating the whole day. He said, I want you to throw over. And they threw over and they had, they had meat in their stomach. He said, you know why? He said, because you have been, you have been gossiping about your brothers and sisters. Namima, Ghiba. You have been talking about your brothers and sisters. And we, we read the Quran Al-Kareem. أَيُحِبُّ أَحَدُكُمْ أَنْ يَأْكُلَ لَحْمَ أَخِيهِ مَيْتًا فكرهتموه. We Muslims believe 
that talking about your brother or sister in his absence in a way he, he or she dislikes is a form of eating meat of that brother or sister while he or she is dead. That heavy. That bad. So he said you were... And doing that during Ramadan is even worse. You have to withhold from that. You have to withhold from food, from drinks, from, as we know, sexual intercourse. You have to withhold from, from, uh, from cursing, from talking bad, from behaving bad. Somebody would say today, but Akhi, you should withhold of, of these things all, all your life. I said, yeah, I know. We don't do that. But Ramadan, it's, it's more, it's heavy. It's more heavy. Because as the brother said, it's a training. It's like yoga. You know, like people do yoga and stay for, for one hour and a half in, in meditation. We have to stay for the whole day in meditation. And if you manage to do that, it will be easier for, for you to do outside of Ramadan. Do you understand? So it, it, I should feel as, as your, your neighbor, your brother or sister, your family, how that Ramadan affects you. So my brothers and sisters, <clears throat> When I talk about this, and I, I just mentioned some of the examples, and I think every one, of, every one of us knows in him or his inner self that we became nowadays traditional Muslims, right? We became formal Muslims. We became Muslims by name, by nature. But our actions are far away from Islam. The way we behave, the way we deal with things, the way we experience our religion, the way we practice our religion is far away from the example of the Prophet ﷺ. And wasn't he the best example of us all? Isn't he, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا He was your best example. Isn't the Prophet وسلم, the man we should refer to in order to understand how we should fast and how we should spend Ramadan? But my brothers and sisters, when we come, deep, when we come closer to the life of the Prophet وسلم, we will see that Ramadan, in Ramadan, he would not be a different person. He would just accelerate more than what he was already doing. His month of Shaban, as we know, he already was fasting in Shaban, right? More. He already was worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more. He was already excelled, doing more in, in Shaban. When Ramadan comes, he would only add to that. So already he was living a life, a, the best manners, the best way of living, leading the example, giving the example. So when Ramadan comes, it actually completes, it gives him more space and more priorities. And that is from the perspective of God-fearing and taqwa, brothers and sisters. That is where we should head, head to. During Ramadan, we should wake up and try to be a better believer. Try to use it as go back to our religion. Try to understand. Try to evaluate. Try to set a mechanism for yourself. What did I do wrong today? To whom was I bad? Try to invite people to your house. What is the last time, you know, when you go to Medina, for example, during Ramadan, and you are in the haram, in the masjid of the Prophet وسلم, during the iftar time, people would fight for you in order to lead you to their place where they have dates and bread, in order to let you break fast with their dates. I remember was, I was traveling uh, uh, with one of my brothers uh, between Medina and, and Jeddah a couple of years ago, and we were intending, I was his guest, and we were intending to have iftar on the, on the highway. So I brought my own dates with me in order to share. When he saw my own dates, he grabbed them from my hand and he put them aside. He said, no, don't, don't take these dates. You have to take mine. I was like, slow down, bro. Slow down. What's happening? Why? Because he wanted, he wanted the benefit. He wanted the ajr. He wanted, he wanted the reward that a traveler coming from far away leaving his family and friends behind in a foreign country would share with him the iftar with his dates. Yeah, subhanallah. How beautiful is that? Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam is teaches, teaching us the one if you as a believer would feed another believer during Ramadan, 
in, break, in breaking his fast, Allah will give you your reward and his reward without making his reward less. SubhanAllah. That's the behavior which we should follow. So think of yourself today during Ramadan. What is the last time I invited randomly somebody, not even somebody I know, not even my friend, not even my family. That's like, that's an obligation. That's a priority number one. What is the last time I chose maybe somebody from the street, not knowing? Maybe somebody who's here studying in the city from, an, from another country who doesn't have a family. Maybe somebody who's here just temporary as a traveler. Did I, when did I for the last time fight with my other brother about somebody in order to break, you know, to break fast? When did I for the last time think about somebody else who is not ha having the ability? When is the light, last time I linked my iftar with the iftar of somebody else in Nairobi or in, or in Ghana or in South Africa? You know what I mean? That's the sympathy which you're supposed to get out of Ramadan only with one reason. If you fast with conscience. Do you know, and I'll close with this, uh, with this sentence because uh, Aisha is already approaching. Do you know what AP is? AP. A from Alpha and P from Paris. Do you know what AP is? No? Associated Press. Associated Press. <laughs> That's a good one. When we talk about, you know, my work, I work back home in the, uh, in the social um, behavior of people and especially on you know, identity matters. So when we talk about AP, we'll talk about automatic pilot. Automatic pilot. So when I tell you, tell us, that we Muslims live our religion on AP, what do you say? And I tell you that we, when we fast, we fast on AP. Automatic pilot. Do you know how, what does a, how does a plane fly on automatic pilot? Pilot. How does a plane fly on automatic pilot? How does it fly? Just a button, yeah? Just a button, nothing else. So the, the captain is, is not in charge, just press the button, I would say, and, he, and, and, a, and the plane doesn't work. That's what we call automatic pilot. Do you know that we human beings usually live our lives on automatic pilot? A button. We drink, we eat, we do what human beings do. We sleep, we go to work, we talk, but we do everything on automatic pilot. Which means unconscious. What is the proof? I'll tell you what's the proof. What is the last time you thanked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he gave you the ability to eat from your mouth and not from your ear? What is the last time you even think about that? That's normal. Everybody eats from his mouth. No, it's not normal. So a lot of people don't have that ability to eat from their mouth because of, of a disability. When is the last time you thought about hearing with your ears and that blessing? What is the last time about you thought about the blessing of your eyes? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّهَا لَا تَعْمَلْ أبصار. It's not the eye who gets blind. وَإِنَّمَا تَعْمَلْ قُلُوبُ الَّتِي فِي الصُّدُورِ It's not your eyes who gets blind, it's your heart, your soul who gets blind. So when we fast unconscious, that's what we do. We just stop eating and drinking, right? And um, when it's, uh, when it's suhoor, and uh, some of us, I mean, I've been into different cultures all around the world, and I'm not going to tell you stories about what we eat at suhoor. You know what I mean? We eat a lot at suhoor. And therefore, I say, on my way, I fast, I prefer to fast the Dutch way. You know what the Dutch way is? In Holland, we eat only one warm meal a day and two cold meals which means breakfast is cold sandwiches light lunch in holland is is, is light sandwiches and at six o'clock evening we have our dinner which is warm different from arabic cultures and muslim cultures do you understand imagine you would do that for ramadan have a light suhoor and a warm iftar you know reasonably warm iftar which is a normal meal and you would spread that iftar between, between Maghrib uh, and Isha, you know, light, light, not every... You know, have you seen our tables, how they look like during iftar? It's like a tsunami. You know, your body can't handle it. It's bad for your body. You know, even an, an animal, if you leave it the whole day fasting, it, it would eat like that. Human beings wouldn't, it wouldn't be... Again, go back to the automatic pilot. 
How do you treat people? How do you talk to people? How do you look like during Ramadan? How do you behave during Ramadan? That's all the rest of your life. How do you pray? Prayer, same thing. You can, you know, this automatic pilot, think about it. But think about how to turn it off. Because I'll tell you, it's frightening to turn it off. It's a confrontation. It's the real world. It's thinking about what you're doing. It's feeling what you're saying. It's before going to bed telling yourself, why am I, am I doing this? I spoke to somebody bad today. Let me call him or her. Let me ask for an apology, right? I was bad to my parents. Before I go to sleep, I have to fix that. I was bad to my wife. I was bad to my husband. Evaluate before you go to sleep because we, we are being told by our scholars, evaluate before somebody else is, will be evaluating with you on the hereafter. Keep it in your hand, brothers and sisters. Make that switch. Wake up. Be conscious. Go back to who you are. Who am I as a believer? Why is it that, that Islam is seeing something and Muslims are doing something else? Why? Why is it? You know, it's, it's, it's for, for somebody who does not know Islam, for somebody who's far away from Islam. He knows the Muslims, right? And he tells you or me all the time, it's... I don't understand you guys. Islam is a religion of peace. We know that, right? We, we say that all the time. Islam is the religion which says a smile, a smile is a charity. Why Muslims don't smile? Why they look so arrogant or so mad or so I don't know it or so unfriendly? Oh, did you hear the hadith? Of alayhi salatu wasalam. We Muslims believe that smile is a charity. Smile then. Give that charity. Don't keep it. Don't be greedy and keep it at home. Practice. We are good in theory. We're not good in practice. We have to link our deeds, our behavior, our whatever we say. And again, brothers and sisters, because whether you want or not, every one of us is an ambassador. Every one of us is an example. So live that example. You don't need to do, believe me. Inviting people to religion, you don't need to do that by saying. You need to do that by doing. You live here in Asia, right? You should all know the story of how Islam came to Indonesia. It didn't come by an army. It didn't come by millions of people. It didn't come with, I don't know what. It came with one man, an Arab. An Arab, a Yemeni. With one man, it started. How did, did he invite people to Islam? He did invite people to Islam by saying, but he behaved as a true believer. And that's how our Sahaba, our leaders, our ancestors used to be. And that's where we are missing the link. So my brothers and sisters, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us a strength in order to be awake, to be aware, to be conscious, to turn off that automatic pilot, to understand our sense, our creation, our being. And to let us be that true believer and that true person who will experience Ramadan. Brothers and sisters, please let us take this chance to be a better person, to be a better human being, to let that month of fasting influence our life properly. Because you know, our scholars taught us that if you want to know, if you want to know if your Ramadan was accepted or not by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, look at your actions after Ramadan. As easy as it is. You service your car. It went through evaluation. They told you you have to fix the tires and the engine. You fixed it. So after that test, it will drive smoothly and beautifully, right? My Maserati is on the road. So what about you? What about your body? What about your, your conscience? What about your soul? Is it ready to go back on the road? Evaluate. You know, we, we in, I don't know if you know, but we, we do a course with an Al-Kawthar. Um, and what we do in that course is we give out something called an action, um, a checklist. I don't know if you know it. Have you ever heard of it? Let me see, I have, yeah, I have it here. I think you can download it and otherwise I can mail it to you. We call it the Month of Mercy Activities Student Checklist. This checklist gives you a week checklist of what you can do, like, you know, Got, got up for Fajr on time, prayed Fajr with the Sunnah, made my morning dhikr, prayed all prayers, etc. You could check that for yourself every day. I did, check, check. I didn't, I did that bad, I did that wrong. Give yourself marks, you know, evaluate yourself. That's how it's supposed to happen. So, and after it finishes Ramadan, be honest with yourself. Look at yourself, look at your deeds, look at behavior. Did I change? You know, it's empowering yourself, right?
It's training yourself. It's time. Forgive me, I always have issues with running out of time. Um, I, uh, forgive me if, I, if there is no chance for questions or maybe that will be... A oh, inshallah. Um, again, uh, my apologies for uh, disturbing you with, um, with these words today and with my presence. I hope Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive me my mistakes and shortcomings. And I hope Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive us uh, our mistakes and shortcomings. Give us strength and iman and enlighten our hearts to live a better life, to be um, um, a believer who contributes to his life, to his environment, to his family. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us strength and enlighten our hearts with iman in order to be happy in this life and the hereafter. Ameen. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaykum. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.